I believe that curation is like a superpower in today's internet. For most people, creating content is actually not the best service that they can provide to society. It is curating the best ideas from the top 1% creators. There are certain creators who I really respect and follow. Like for example, I read everything that Ben Thompson writes. I read everything that Matt Levine writes. As interesting to me, what I'm listening to is the thought I have in my head of like, what is going into their body? What is informing their views? What are the interesting things they're reading and consuming such that they're outputting these ideas? And so like, this is like a bigger swing that's like an idea I haven't seen, but I would love a world where basically curation as a service becomes a thing. Alex Lieberman, co-founder of Morning Brew, lover of ideas, lover of business <laughs> ideas. So you're in the right place. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I am quite the the hopeless romantic around business ideas, but I'm excited to be jamming with another hopeless romantic about business ideas. So one of your ideas really got me thinking, Sports Illustrated. I hadn't heard that name in a while. Tell me, tell me your Sports Illustrated idea. Yeah. So Sports Illustrated has, um, unfortunately, like a, a checkered recent history. Um, Sports Illustrated, I believe, is owned by, I always get it wrong because there's so many companies involved in this, but there's basically arena group and there's authentic brands and authentic brands, I believe, own Sports Illustrated and they'd given the license to arena group for some period of time to use the Sports Illustrated name and and build the company. And long story short, things broke down and Sports Illustrated's in entire staff was laid off. So the entire staff of Sports Illustrated was laid off. So which to me tells me there's now this entire repository of content created over the years from Sports Illustrated. There's a, a shit ton of emails of people who clearly have opted into caring about sports and sports information. And so, you know, I am sure right now that the owners of Sports Illustrated Authentic are probably shopping Sports Illustrated, shopping the license to the highest bidder. But I think it's going to take a very specific type of company to kind of revive the brand. Because like to me, Sports Illustrated peaked in the 90s, maybe the early 2000s, and it's kind of lost relevancy in the internet age. And I just think there's such a massive opportunity to build like the great daily sports newsletter, right? Like this was something that Kendall Baker had um, first with sports internet. Then he sold to Axios. He had Axios sports for a while. He just left and he's running Yahoo sports his newsletter, but I don't think there's like the go-to daily sports newsletter. And I think to have a head start with sports illustrated's list, whether or not I would even have to use the brand, like it's actually kind of irrelevant to me. Like if I could just get the list by the list, even if it's not tied to the Sports Illustrated name and I don't have to pay a ton for the license, I think there's just a great morning brew for sports that can be built, especially if you have a head start with a massive corpus of emails for people who care about following sports on a daily basis. So I'm surprised you said that. So I'm surprised that you you just buy the list, like you're open to buying the list. Why? I don't know. You, to me, you seem like a, a brand guy, and I could see, I could see how you would be kind of like a hopeless romantic, also for brands. And I could, I could have the conversation could have gone like this. Could have been like, you know, I remember when I was twelve years old, and I used to be, you know, I was in my childhood bedroom, yeah, and I'd be reading Sports Illustrated, and I had such a connection with the brand, and it was, you know, the beacon of the beacon of sports and I I'm missing that feeling and the brand's diluted. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Uh, now you're, now you're having my brain go about how for the longest time I wanted to bring back Dunkaroos, uh, because Dunkaroos were not for a long time. The product wasn't being created. And if you wanted to buy Dunkaroos, I remember this in college. Um, my mom literally had to order boxes of Dunkaroos from Canada because it was the only place in the world that you could buy Dunkaroos from. And I had massive boxes in my dorm room. And I always thought about, what if I bought Dunkaroos and just brought back the brand? Look, I think that there is absolutely value, 100%. There's a ton of brand equity to the Sports Illustrated name. I'm also just, I guess, trying to be realistic about what you probably have to pay for the license for that brand. Like I would assume it's a non- uh, nominal amount of money. So if money wasn't a factor, 
of course, I'd love to have something that is like the daily newsletter from Sports Illustrated because you can kind of draft off the brand equity. But I guess let's just assume I had to pay seven figures for an annual license for the Sports Illustrated name to be able to use their list. Or let's say I could spend $50,000 to buy their emails. I feel way better about being able to build, uh, convince an email list of qualified sports junkies about the quality of a product I put out by hiring a badass n- newsletter writer than I do about having to, in a year, basically from scratch, build a business that's doing at least seven figures just to cover the cost of the license. So I, in theory, I, I like it. I just feel like it would cost a lot more to have to license it out, but I could be wrong because I haven't done a licensing deal before. So if I were to, if I were to do that deal, if I, what I would do would be I would come up with a pitch called sports really sports really illustrated dot com, <laughs> and I would knowing that there's so much turmoil in this asset, I would contact someone on authentic brands. I would cold DM them, get a meeting, and I would say, yeah, I'll pay you X amount of dollars for this license for this newsletter, and it's it's the concept is. It's kind of like what Pomp's doing with Bay Area Times, like the visual newsletter. It's a it's a visual newsletter for sports junkies. I, I like that. By the way, where I see another opportunity here is I think a lot of people in like old media don't understand the kind of the value of attaching a media brand to um, a non-media company to provide top of funnel for it. So like I'd also if I wanted like a quick way to monetize this, I'd hit up someone, I would hit up companies that I think would benefit a ton from the Sports Illustrated list and their top of funnel, whether it's a sports betting company, whether it's a sports memorabilia company, et cetera. I'd get them interested. And then I would try to help broker the deal between basically what happened between HubSpot and The Hustle uh, or you know Barstool and Penn, what does that look like in the context of Sports Illustrated and how can I broker this in a way where like maybe Authentic isn't thinking about positioning the brand in this way? What do you think is going through Authentic's mind right now? Because for folks who don't know, like uh, Authentic Brands is is huge. I just checked their yep. revenue. They do 21 billion a year of revenue. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize this, but they own Reebok. They own Forever 21. They're massive. They own, they're massive. So it's a conglomerate. Um and they're probably looking at this and this is being like, this is a thorn. In our Exa- side right that's now. what I was going to say. Yeah. I think they're just like, this is, I think this is the equivalent of a VC who invests in a business that uh, at some point you realize the business is not going to be their fund returner. And they're like, fuck, now I need to sit, attend their board meetings, do all these things. And it's never going to be the thing that's actually worth my time. I think that is probably how they're looking at it. Which actually, to that point, means there could be an opportunity just like to to be a headache remover for them. And going back to you know acquiring newsletters, you obviously have a lot of experience in this space. How do you go about uh, you know thinking about a framework for what's the right yeah. price for a newsletter? Yeah. By the way, one just thing I would say here is like this. Uh, I'm using the example of Sports Illustrated. But, but there's a similar kind of approach I would take with other companies. And the approach here is like, I always talk about this idea of the hub and spoke model of just like latching onto hubs that already have access to built-in distribution. So you don't have to start from day one, right? That's what you would do with latching onto Sports Illustrated's email list. But I think there are so many companies that don't re- still, it's crazy to me, but still don't realize the value of email. And even if they do realize the value of email, they they have not taken the step of putting a ton of work into making email a true destination product and monetizing it effectively. So I'll just use an example for you. Like um, Epic Gardening. Have you heard of Epic Gardening? Of course. Okay. So I was talking to Kevin from Epic Gardening and Epic, well, like they're mad. Well, yeah. Explain, explain what it is. Explain what Epic yeah, Gardening so, is. Yeah, yeah. So Epic Gardening is basically like the go-to YouTube channel for green thumbs for people who are into gardening and learning everything about uh, the process of gardening, techniques, products, right? Like what's really interesting about Epic Gardening's business is, I I don't know if their numbers are public, so I'm not going to say them, but basically it's a, you know, a multi-million dollar business that does monetize through advertising. And the way they monetize through ads is the Epic Gardening 
website, uh, the YouTube channel. Um, and, but so like, it's all through, like they have sponsored content, uh, through the media asset, but actually the way they make the majority of their money is through product sales. Uh, Kevin and Epic Gardening bought a seed company that they sell through their channels. And so they do both direct to consumer, but they also sell their seeds wholesale. And that was part of kind of like the thesis that Chernin, who's invested in a lot of these, right, like kind of niche passion area media companies goes into the deal with, which is like, you have a passionate audience. How do we build kind of like this content to commerce model? So anyway, that's Epic Gardening. Their YouTube channel has um, 3 million subscribers, I believe. And there, by the way, there's another kind of like side lesson we can, or side quest we can go down of Kevin just launched a new YouTube channel and it is super uh, on natural, like super low edit, him just talking to camera and it's grown to 15,000 followers in a few weeks. And so it's interesting to see why like that is doing well. But anyway, Epic Gardening has 3 million subscribers and from talking to Kevin, they have an email newsletter, but I would say because they have a lot of other things going on, Um, because email isn't their expertise, there's a ton of untapped potential in having a great daily or three times a week newsletter for the modern gardener. And I would love to explore a deal. Maybe Epic is not the right brand to do it with because they've gone kind of the venture route, but what would it look like to relaunch their newsletter as a daily newsletter for gardeners, hire a great writer, use the organic distribution strategies we use to grow Morning Bruce. They have 3 million YouTube subscribers. Like you should be able to get that list to 500,000 subscribers quickly. And what would it look like to do a revenue share deal where I, we basically are the ones driving the newsletter and we make money through some rev share that we drive on all ads or commerce that comes from the newsletter. Like, why aren't you doing this? You know, this sounds, this is, this to me, this sounds like such a no brainer. It's like you're, what you're talking about is morning brew for X, but partnering with a creator and doing rev share. Um, you know, you did such hard work to, as you know, like the struggles of going zero to one and, yep. and it's like with the creator in mind like this, you, you, it's easier. The hard part is the fulfillment, which is how do you write the content? How do you, but like, you know, that like, you know, yeah, back and, to, and to me, that's actually like, that's, that is where I could bring advantage because I would yeah. say like it, there was so much like blood, sweat and tears to figure out what makes a great newsletter writer, what great makes a great newsletter in the early days. But it's like, you know, I kind of understand the process now. Yeah. So it's, I think that's another interesting path as well. Say less, say less, my guy. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, We'll uh, we'll table that one for a bit. Authentic brands. Let's see what happens there. Canadian company. So I have some I'm connection, you know, some connection there. But I think I think someone is going to buy this, and uh, someone is going to do really well. And and let's just end it with there's going to be a bunch of these opportunities. Um, I've talked about on the show. Buzzfeed is a kind of a similar opportunity. Yep. I'm curious before we end on this note, wh- what other similar type of companies have you seen where there's an opportunity to to get involved to be honest with you like it sounds bad but i think and it's any legacy media brand that stands for something uh that is cutting headcount or staff at bare minimum and closing their doors at maximum is an opportunity for this because i still have yet to meet a legacy media company that truly thinks about their newsletter as a destination because it was always an afterthought to driving site content or driving social views. So like if you, it, it's actually like, to me, the exception to the rule would be some old school media company that's great with newsletter, but I can't think of an example. So whether it's Rolling Stone or, uh, you know, what's the the name of the uh, newspaper, like Good Housekeeping or like, like I think like actually niche legacy brands could be as if not more interesting as like creator brands today, because I think creators actually are like kind of more with it and understand the value of email, I think legacy brands like actually still don't understand the value of email, but they're just looking to get anything for their business right now because they're struggling so much. And, and and I also, and you know, just to say, I think there's a few reasons that like, it's an interesting time to pick up undervalued assets in media. I think one is you have a number of, and this has been happening for the last few years, but it's still happening. Another, a number of venture backed media companies that were great businesses if they weren't venture backed and are horrible businesses if they are venture backed. And I think 
We've seen some of those already either have down rounds, layoff staff, shutdown, et cetera. And I think you'll see more of those. But then I think you're just also at an interesting time in kind of what I would call like traditional or mainstream media, where there's less trust than ever before in mainstream monolithic uh, media brands. Uh, the advertising market for the last year and a half has been absolute dog shit. Uh, the, to run one of these businesses, they're so cost intensive. They, they run these businesses so fat. And so I think you're just going to kind of continue to see this wave of businesses either cutting staff or closing doors altogether. So basically put a Google alert for, you know, different media companies and layoffs and a hundred percent and, you know, reach out to these people. You'd be surprised. Like people are going to listen to this and be like, no, they're you know, easy for them to say, you know, they, he started morning group. Of course they're going to open their email, but like, I don't know, 15 years ago when I, or 10 years ago when no one knew my name at all either. And I would reach out to people and I would be surprised. It's a numbers game. Yeah. And by the way, what I would say is like, okay, maybe for me, it's going to a business and it's rejuvenating, rejuvenating their email newsletter and doing a rev share on it. By the way, the way I think about this model is like, it's basically the digital version of Sushi by Boo. Do you know, do you know Sushi by Boo's model? No. Oh, so it's the most genius model. So Sushi by Boo that we have one, there's a few in New York city. Uh, it's, it's like a high end omakase chain. Um, we have a few in New York city. Uh, my wife and I live in Hoboken. They just opened one in Hoboken and their model is genius. Every sushi by boo is in a hotel and they go to a hotel and they say, Hey, hotel, let's say your lobby is 3000 square feet. See the, see those 250 square feet in the corner of your lobby that right now has a chair and maybe a chess table. Let us, let us build a sushi bar right there. And what we're going to do is you're not going to charge us rent on it because you'd be doing nothing with that space as it is. We're going to open the sushi bar. We're going to mark it because we already have locations all over the country and we're going to do a rev share. You're going to keep 20% of all revenue that we generate for the sushi bar. We keep 80%. And if it doesn't work out, we leave your hotel and you have the unused lobby that you had before. If it does work out, you've just automatically opened up a revenue stream you never had with your business. And forget about the revenue stream, it the cachet that it adds. Exactly. You, you have like an omakase in your exactly. in your hotel. Oh, I'm, like, sh I'm sure part of their pitch is, yeah, like look at what happens to your hotel prices when we put this in. Exactly. So I think, damn, that's really good. Yeah. That's really good. And it's also just a reminder that you you know, you know you don't necessarily need to get inspiration from Twitter or podcasts, like the real world. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I mean, this is talked about ad nauseum, but I like, I just generally think the best inspiration is drawn not from the industry that you're in or the bubble that you're in. It's like just literally pattern matching from another industry where something has worked. And that was the thing I was going to say is like, okay, sure. For me, maybe I, I have an unfair advantage to approach a business and relaunch their newsletter and open up a new revenue stream for them. But like, that doesn't have to be the thing. Uh, you know, your thing is community. You could go to a business and do the same thing of like, let me assemble a community around yeah. your hardcore fans and we'll do a rev share there. It's like, what is your core competency that can open up a new revenue stream for a hurting business and approach them with an already existing plan, what the rev share is. And I am guaranteeing you they'll listen because they are desperate to listen. Yeah. And basically everyone is hurting. Like if you're, unless you're like an, unless you're open AI, you're, you're looking for new revenue sources. Yep. Um, so people are pretty uh, open to these opportunities right now. So, and I don't know how, you know, interest rates might go down lower, cheap money might come, you know, this might not be forever. So I would suggest like now is the time. Totally. Um, I want to move on to your Weight Watchers idea. They're actually a, a past client of our innovation oh, really? agency. So... Uh, there's only so much I could say, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll do the talking here and you can just react. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just in Florida, uh, with my grandparents and they have done weight watchers for the last like five years. And I asked them, why do they do it? By the and way, explain weight watchers because Americans know what weight watchers is, but actually the vast majority of non-Americans don't know what it is and explain why it's genius. Totally. And, and by the way, you, you may be able to fill in the gaps here because I just know it's secondhand for my grandparents. I've never done Weight Watchers myself. So my understanding is Weight Watchers is a dieting program 
that involves a combination of like uh, an actual like program and system. And the way the syst- the the Weight Watcher system is basically that if you want to lose weight, you have a certain amount of points of food a day, and basically every food has a different point value associated with it. So I can't remember what my grandparents are, but let's just say it's like they could have 30 points a day. You know, when you're thinking about having food, you look up on the Weight Watcher site, how many points that food is associated with. And you know that you will lose weight if you hit your 30 point total uh, intake per day. And so there's this system that you have to follow that um, if you're a part of Weight Watchers. On top of that, there are weekly meetings. So My grandma and grandpa attend a weekly meeting every Saturday morning where they go, they weigh in. So they, they see how they are tracking on their weight relative to the last meeting, but it's everyone else in their area. That's part of Weight Watchers. And it almost feels like the way they described it is like AA where the group is congregated and talking about what is working for them, what is not, and any new recipes or foods they have that they recommend to the group because there's like a low point value, but like it's a really hearty or tasty meal. It, it, did I did I hit generally what it is, or is there anything I'm missing? There's all so yes, you're you're you you nailed it except for one little thing that has sent the stock up like a hundred percent this year. Or oh, last is this year. the is this the investment in like the company the the weight loss drugs? <laughs> yes. So you, you know, but, chair, yeah. yeah, basically Ozempic and the like have obviously taken the world by storm. Weight Watchers is a community based program that works like the system works like people go to these meetings they follow the system and there's some amazing results some people don't want to put in the work your grandparents want to put in the work some people don't and especially the younger generation so they actually uh invested in i think it's a glp1 drug and uh so it's kind of like hey do you want to lose weight this way do you want to lose that weight uh, weight that way so they're giving yep. more options to folks to lose weight. Yep. And specifically the company was Sequence. Yes. That they bought, I think it was in March of last year. And basically my understanding is it's a telehealth obesity treatment platform. And so it's basically if you're exploring weight loss via one of these drugs, whether it's Ozembic or Wagovi, it's a platform where you talk to an expert and then you end up getting uh, basically recommended or prescribed one of these drugs. Exactly. Yeah. And and just to go to the idea for a second, basically, there's just like a few interesting trends that I think line up to, to have an interesting business for 20 to 30 somethings who are looking to lose weight. The first is like, I think weight loss has been important for a long time to people um, in kind of the modern age where like health has been emphasized. But I feel like we're, we are in kind of like a hyperdrive period around body and health optimization. And I think like you're seeing interesting things pop up, like what, you know, Brian Johnson, AK zero is doing with, uh, I think blueprint is the name of it, right? Where like Brian Johnson has literally created this blueprint for trying to extend his age and never die. And I think that is going to resonate with some people. I think it's especially going to resonate with like startup, like kind of like super early adopter, uh, folks who are like kind of in a good way, extremists about going all out on a certain goal of longevity and health. But I think for the average person, like the average millennial, like that's going to feel too intense. It's going to feel too intense to think about the idea of doing a blood transfusion (laughs) in order to save a few years of your life. And so, and at the same time, right, like this post COVID age, I think has just created this constant reminder of the importance of community, community and the importance of like in-person gathering. It's like why I'm sitting in Morning Brew's office right now is like, I realized how much much I miss that. And so I think, you know, it's definitely a good thing for Greg Eisenberg. Like there's never been more emphasis or value placed on community. And so I think this idea of like community accountability and like emphasis on a health program that helps you lose weight. And I think especially at a time where like Ozembic and Wagovi are being talked about. But I think for every like story about it, there's going to be like a negative story about how this is like not a sustainable way to be healthy. And it's not, it's not for everyone. I think this kind of model of diet program with accountability group, I haven't seen it exist for our age. Like there's some like new modalities, like I think Noom has been very successful, but like 
I tried Noom. It wasn't successful for me. I, I think peer accountability or group accountability with Dye program can be really interesting. So I what agree you with you. I agree with you, but I want to say a few things. So one is what's interesting is if you look at the Google Trends data, like the search and in, search interest data over the last 11 years for weight loss, it's actually gone down. So interesting. So interesting. And why do you, why do you think that is? And spoil, spoiler alert, it's not because everyone's fit now. You know, it's not like people are magically way more fit in 2024 than they were in 2013. I think that when I think about, okay, so I think this idea could work if you rebrand weight loss to this generation. Um, I think the reason why people are not searching weight loss anymore is because weight loss to me feels like a term that was very popular in the 80s and 90s. It's like when Diet Coke was everywhere and like the diet phenomenon, you know, aspartame got really yeah. popular. So I think people, a lot of people tried to diet and realized dieting is just difficult. You know, it's a lot of work. You have to put in your work. And let's be real. People don't want to put in the work. That's why they're taking a drug, literally a drug to, to, to lose shortcut. weight, to shortcut. Yeah. And if I was trying to create something in this space, what I would do is I would brand it as like the drugs are bad for you.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd counter position it against drugs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I would make it a challenge, like join the challenge, a free challenge that people can join. Kind of like um, I really like uh, smallbets.co. Have you seen that? No. It's like, if you go to their website, interested in entrepreneurship, forget about starting a company. Try making $1,000 with a small project first. So it's basically a bunch. It's like events plus community around people who are. This is cool. Yeah. Trying to try new things. And just the idea, like the brand around small bets is really interesting. I would do a challenge, basically. My point is I would do a challenge. Email based, yeah. maybe text based even. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost kind of like, it's like a modern version of, or like there's aspects of it that remind me of like orange theory. Like, I don't know if you know the orange theory model, but like basically called hundreds of orange theory locations around the U S every day, orange theory has the same workout in every single studio. So every studio on that day has everyone doing the same workout. And there are basically leaderboards of, and, and when you go to orange theory, they have like their proprietary scores, which are like kind of like how long you're in the orange zone, how many like splat points you earned. And every day there's a leaderboard for the people who earn the most splat points or were in the orange zone the longest. And so I can imagine a world in, in which like kind of there's the same challenges that exist across all groups within this program. And there's both short term goals and long term goals or challenges that people are competing against. And there's fun and interesting prizes around it. Yeah, and I think what's so brilliant about that splat points, I never heard heard about that, is like you can only get your splat points in one place. You know, exactly. Like it's a it's a when you own these terms, it's a moat that is very very defensible. Yeah, and by the way, one thing I'll also just say here is beyond just like the let's call it like the modern day Weight Watchers. I think there's like a broader thing that's interesting, which is seeing more and more businesses. This is more of a trend that are like capitalizing on the idea of peer groups. I don't know exactly where like the most interesting opportunity is yet, but like, I think you have everything from like peer groups on the fringes to like peer groups that are more mainstream. So like what I consider to be like fringe peer groups is like men's groups, like men's groups feel very much still like they're this thing that exists for like, you know, super liberal people living in Brooklyn or like uh, startup founders for a group of eight to 10 men to talk about, to have vulnerable conversations with each other. But I, it still doesn't feel like it has gotten to mass market. Um, then you have like peer groups in the form of um, AA, which has been around for ever. And I think honestly, AA is just a model for anyone who is interested in community building and group dynamics. Like should just read the big book and study AA, AA's history. But I think there's an interesting model of what does AA look like for tech addiction? I would mm -hmm. join that because I'm so addicted to my technology. But then you have like more mainstream applications that are popping up. Like, I don't know if you saw the founders of SoulCycle just launched a peer group business where like they were basically like, what would SoulCycle look like if we launched 
the business without the bicycle. That was like their whole thing. We launched the business without the bicycle. And it's like, basically it's a, a space. It's a, they do it virtual and in-person. In-person, they launched a studio in New York City where a group of strangers come in and they have deep, meaningful conversations that almost acts as like their spiritual rejuvenation or workout on a weekly basis. I don't know what the right entry point is here, but to me, there's a reason that all of this is happening. Do you remember the name of the Soul Cycle experience? Peoplehood. Peoplehood. So I was a part of, I think, the first or second or one of the first Peoplehood in person meetups in 2019. Are you serious? Yeah. Um, so I was invited. And it's really interesting because they basically, I forget the name of the author, but they 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 worked with some well-known author in the space who has a system for uh, having good relationships with people. Yep. And so they basically, in, in a way, they licensed this system and their product, they productized it via a peer-to-peer group and via uh, an app. And it's brilliant. And it's a similar, it's the similar concept to, like the weight, you know, the Weight Watchers point system or the orange yeah. theory. Like it's always start with the system, build, you know, actually, what is it? Let's break it down. It's category of one. How do you build a category of one? It's how do you build a system that is super scalable? Yep. And what else am I missing? Uh, well, and to me, it's like, I, I mean, this is the obvious one, but like, how do you hit on like a... um an acute need that it's that's most needed right now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's where I'll say, like, I both understand it, but I also think it's a hard business. So like what people it is doing to me is capitalizing on this, you know, kind of like all of this narrative around loneliness, right? Like you see all these studies around loneliness in society and I do believe it, but I also think it's way harder to build a great business off of that because it's always less tangible. It feels more ephemeral. You want to join a dieting program, you very clearly know if you're losing 10 pounds. And other people very clearly know if you're losing 10 pounds. Whether you feel less lonely or not, it feels like a squishier problem to solve for someone. Yeah, unless unless it's improving, you know, I think they call it relation, relationship fitness or so it's improving a relationship. So unless you're going with, your, you know, your, your partner. Uh, oh, your, totally. And yeah. that's like, to me, that's... um. That's why I always wonder, like, even as I was talking about, like, the AA for tech addiction. And by the way, the reason I have that idea is because I think for me to be less addicted to my technology, I need accountability built in. Because when I've tried different apps, I just don't follow the rules and I stay addicted. But I will say the reason I think even that business is harder to build is because while I really want to change that behavior, it doesn't feel like the same level of desperation to someone who is in, you know, the throes of addiction and it's ruining every aspect of their life. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, maybe there's an opportunity to go to AA and just be like, hey, like, you know, cell phone addiction is the new. So they la- so they launched their their own group. That's uh, ITAA. It's Internet and Technology uh, Addicts Anonymous. And I attended a meeting. <laughs> and how was it? It was fascinating. Um, Were you live streaming it? I didn't live stream it. No, but I, it was on <laughs> Zoom. It was virtual. Um, Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Pretty antithetical, right? Um, I will say that the, that makes you realize uh, how, how that makes no sense, right? That's like having a Weight Watchers meeting at like at, at a McDonald's. McDonald's. Yeah, <laughs> it's so true. Um, it, <laughs> Yeah, take it up with AA. Um, but yeah, I think it was uh, really interesting for a few reasons. I think one of the values of AA and just these groups in general is it makes you feel uh, less isolated. Like I always thought I was really addicted to my phone. But then when you hear some of these people share their stories about how they say for the last decade, once a week, they pull an all nighter because they are on their phone literally through 24 hours straight. And it's gotten to the point of suicidal ideation. You're like, holy shit. Like there, there's another level of this. I think the other interesting thing is I had a certain image in my head of who is the person that's addicted to their technology. And while let's say there are 20 people in this meeting, while well, say five of the people in the meeting lined up with my vision, 15 of them did not at all. Like I can't tell you how many middle-aged moms who are addicted to playing Candy Crush on their home, uh, on their phone when they're at home for hours a day were in this meeting as well. 
And so I think it the for me, actually, there wasn't so much like programming or education in it. There was this feeling of uh, you're not alone. And it sounds so obvious, but when you experience that feeling, it, it really is kind of infectious to want to keep experiencing it. Uh, I love it. Like, I, I, I just love it. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's move to a new idea. Uh, okay. G2, personality driven G2. What do you mean by that? Okay. So, you know, G2 is like the software review site. Yeah. Which is really big. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. Um, it's huge. Yet in some way, I've never gone to G2 to make software choices. Yeah. And why do you think that's Have the case? you? No. And I, and I buy tons of software. Yeah. I'm constantly what? buying. So I bought software today. And like, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Isn't that crazy though? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think the reason is one is like the, the business model is inherently broken, like because it thrives off of like sponsored posts and sponsored listings. There's just this inherent question about the authenticity of the recommendations. And I think this is like a question that kind of like any uh, sponsored content driven site goes through. I also think G2 is for a certain demographic that really isn't like in my mind, focused on call it like the like new age businesses or venture back founders or internet companies. Like it feels like it's more focused on older school, larger corporations. I could be wrong, but I'm just going off of the fact of none of my friends have ever used G2. And so I think there is an interesting way to help founders and executives make smarter decisions around their software in a more scalable way than Greg texting one of his friends to ask them, what, hey, what do you use for video editing? Because that friend could be the right person to give you the recommendation, but they also may not be the right person to give you the recommendation. So pin that idea for a second. Have you heard of a business called kit.co? No, I have not. Oh, okay, yeah. So go to- I've been here, but I haven't used it. Yeah. Okay. So kit.co is a place where content creators can share their gear stack. So for example- Right now, I'm on Marquez Brownlee, you know, one of the big YouTubers, MKBHD, his setup. So I'm on his page right now. It's kit.co slash MK, MKBHD slash my uh, setup. And it shows me exactly what his setup is. So I see he has a Yamaha studio monitor or Herman Miller and body chair. Very fancy, Marquez. Uh, Next desk, Air Pro, Sennheiser, headphones, etc. Basically, my view is combine kit.co and G2. Mm. What if there was a place where entre entrepreneurs and executives cre can create their software stack, where they list out all of the tools they use to run their business or their part of their business. They can review the tool. They can provide some notes. So there's nuance. So people can understand, like, is this right for me in the context of my business? And you can actually do revenue shares with the people that create their stacks. So all of a sudden you as a platform, you can set up affiliate deals with, say, the 250 most commonly um, referenced software uh, companies on the platform by your creators, and you get affiliates when anyone signs up through your platform, and that affiliate is shared with all of the creators who have listed their stack. So there's an incentive for them to have a stack and continue updating their stack. I'm just looking at this. like This seems like a no-brainer idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um and by the way, one reason I say this is there's an entrepreneur I know, and I don't know if he wants people to know this, so I'm not going to say who it is, mm -hmm. who built a popular direct-to-consumer company, sold this company, and he has found a way, he, he has manually built his stack. So he created a Google Doc that has all the software and the agencies that he used to build his company. It's a Google Doc. It's in his LinkedIn bio. When someone follows him on Twitter... He, they get an auto DM from him saying hello, as well as if they're interested in the tools he's used to build his company, they get access to the Google doc. He's currently doing $40,000 a month in affiliate fees from this doc. And by the way, a huge value of this platform to creators is it is an absolute pain in the ass to set up all these affiliate deals. Mm -hmm. I have, I, I'm setting this up for myself right now and I'm going company by company by company, some of which have affiliate deals, some of which I'm having create affiliate deals for the first time. It's a nightmare. Yeah, and kit.co really isn't geared towards us, like the sort of the right. B2B creator. Like this feels exactly. this feels very like consumer-y. Uh, it feels YouTube-y. Yeah, exactly. 
which is great for them. I actually think that they exactly. picked the wrong market, but you know, this is this is the right market. <laughs> this is the right market. The, the market where the average deal size is 250k is the right market. Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mr. Beast is like gloating about getting 250k for like what 100 million views on YouTube. <laughs> exactly. Thinking of myself, that's a hard yeah. that's a hard game I don't want to play. Totally. I'm like, wow, that was a lot of work, my friend. Yeah. Um, cool. Let's uh, let's do a couple more. Um, okay. Pinterest for knowledge. My wife works at Pinterest, yeah. so you know. Oh, nice. Don't don't displace her yet. No, no. I I like I like Pinterest. So basically, I mean, this is like an idea that I have been so passionate about since launching the brew and I haven't seen a great solution for this is I believe, um, I believe that curation is like a superpower in today's internet. And the reason I believe that is because it's never been easier to create content. More content is being created than ever before. And my belief on all this, where this kind of ends up netting out five to 10 years from now is you just have this messy middle of a ton of regurgitated mediocre content that's put out onto the internet. And you just still have this small band of the top 0.1% to 1% ideas that doesn't really get that much larger because there aren't that many of those people that have truly novel or like um, best in class ideas. And so my view is like, for most people, creating content is actually not the best service that they can provide to society. It is curating the best ideas from the top 1% creators. And I've had this idea because like there are certain creators who I really respect and follow. Like, for example, I read everything that Ben Thompson writes. I read everything that Matt Levine writes. Um, I listen to Andrew Huberman's podcasts. Um, I listen to Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcasts. As interesting to me as what I'm listening to is the thought I have in my head of like what is going into their body. What is informing their views? What are the interesting things they're reading and consuming such that they're outputting these ideas? And so, and and uh, like, I don't know if you saw, like there's a lot of people who already curate what they're consuming just in this manual way. Like Chamath, Chamath comes out with a newsletter every week. That's what I read this week. And it's like a link dump of seven URLs. To me, I would love a platform where I can follow the... I can basically go down the rabbit hole of individuals' brains. So I can follow the people whose brains I admire most, and I can see exactly what is the shit that they're putting into their brains. And not only can I follow them, but I see an interesting where, way where like, ultimately you can create stacks. You can create stacks of the stuff you consume around fitness, the stuff you consume around uh, like the world of frontier tech or hardware, whatever it may be. And I see a world in which you can actually have premium subscriptions to people's curated content where you not only get the curation, you get the notes and the annotations, people's analysis of the stuff that they're reading within their curated stacks. And so like, I, again, this is like a bigger swing. That's like an idea I haven't seen, but I would love a world where basically curation as a service becomes a thing. This is one of those ideas, which is like, I don't want to do at all, exactly. but someone do it. Exactly. So we, you know, I, I was at, I worked at a company called StumbleUpon, which was like yep. an OG content discovery app. You'd press a button, the stumble button, and it would bring on a web page. And yep. you were able to like it and dislike it. One of the most interesting features was stumbling other people's likes. Exactly. So, you know, Garrett Camp, who's the co-founder of Uber, he's also the co-founder of StumbleUpon. You can go and he's got amazing taste. And you, you'd be able to go on to his likes and just see what's, what is he putting into his brain? I think uh, I agree that th that that stumble likes needs to be reincarnated in some new exactly. form. Exactly. It's like, what if I could see Greg Eisenberg's bookmarks on Twitter? Yeah. And, and I think you just brought up a word that to me is like becoming more and more, it's being more and more emphasized than ever before, which is taste. In a world of hyper commoditization, where software is commoditized, where uh, content's being commoditized, where like many things are becoming, um, where we are being displaced by technology. I think taste, like having being an incredible tastemaker is actually one of the greatest advantages you can have. Like to me, when I think about people who have individuals who have unfair advantage in different industries, whether it's music agents who find talent super early, whether it's 
uh, media entrepreneurs who find writers early in their career, um, whether it's podcasters who decide the topics or the guests that are worth surfacing. I actually think taste is like, it, it's only the early days of taste being one of the more important things or skills that the best, let's call it professionals or entrepreneurs will have. So I got a text today from a creator that you know, millions of followers. And she says, random question. She doesn't text me a lot. So I saw she texted me. I'm like, whoa, let me open this up. Random question. Hiring those who have quote unquote taste. How do you define taste visual editorial? For instance, my head of HR does not have taste, aka his dress style, his word choice. But how do I screen that and define taste? So I responded, I don't know if this is right, but this is what I said. I just wrote in quotation marks. Who do you follow on Instagram? What are your favorite brands? What was the last concert you went to? What is your favorite drink? Can you make a mood board on Pinterest on XYZ topic, dot, dot, dot? Yeah, basically what you're saying is you use specific examples to basically say, have the person show you their taste. Yeah, and exactly. then it's in a, in a meta way, you have to, in a meta way, it's almost like a kind of like a, like an overconfidence thing of to, to assess this, you have to assume you have good taste right. and you're assessing someone else's taste based on your taste of their taste. Exactly. I mean, we used to have, technology assessments it's like hey can you like write this program now we're gonna have yeah. taste taste assessments yeah i think um yeah i think it's uh what's like the the famous definition of product market fit it's like how do you know when you see product market fit it's you don't like it's like hardcore porn you just know it when you see it it's like um you just know the people on the internet that have great taste and you know the people that don't like uh i want like sean purry I would say Sean Purry has great taste. Like he has great taste in what entrepreneurs are going to naturally feel a, a magnetic pull towards. Could I write a, a presentation defining the taste of Sean Purry? I think it'd be really fucking difficult because there's 15 years of context, of prefer, uh, career context that has led him to using his gut a lot. And his gut is this incredible uh, amalgamation of data, data points over many years. So like he has taste, but it'd be very hard for me to define what his taste is. Totally. And I, and I want to say you can be older and have taste, but you can also be young and have great taste. Yeah. And actually I'd argue one of the most impressive things to me is when you are a generation different than like you have great, let, let's just use it as an example of like Matt Levine, Matt Levine I think has great taste on what he talks about for like millennials or young professionals. But I think he wouldn't, I don't think he's considered a millennial. I think he's considered like a generation older. And I, I would say that's actually sometimes what's most impressive to me is when people are able to basically straddle generations with quality taste, because I'm even seeing for myself, when I look at like my younger cousin who's still in high school and what is deemed as good taste for her friend group and people of her age, it's, super difficult because you basically have to immerse yourself in living in the way that her friend group lives while also living in your age group. So if we think that the the world is going to appreciate taste more, I mean, if we're hiring for taste, I'm sure, yep. and I'm sure there's others. How do you monetize taste? Like besides getting a job with, and besides creating a, a Pinterest for yeah. knowledge. Yeah. What's it, what's an easier way to monetize your taste without raising a bunch of venture capital and, and going crazy? Uh, I mean, you know what one way is, uh, is, uh, what's the name of the, I want to I want to find the name of this one. Isn't there a website called like really good sites or really yeah. good design? Yes. Really good emails. Like I, yeah. Really good emails. Yeah. Like I'm like, what does really good emails look like in a different vertical for people who need inspiration to do their job? Basically, I don't know how really good emails monetizes, but basically it's like I'm on their website right now and it's very clearly for email marketers and really good emails has basically used their taste and their judgment. And people come to really good emails because they trust their judgment to look at a collection of different email newsletter designs that they deem to be high quality. I think it's interesting to think about like, and I know there's another uh, website that does this for ad creative. I can't remember what they're called, but there's like an inspiration site for if you're a paid marketer and you want to look at great creative to run on Facebook or Instagram, whatever I'd think about what is another vertical where a B2B professional needs great inspiration to do their job effectively. 
Yeah, and they do really good emails. I'm looking right now. They've got like a hundred, hundred and sixty nine thousand uh, subscribers to their email. They charge nine dollars a month, and you get unlimited collections. You can sort, you can filter. There's a Chrome extension. I'm sure they do. Yep. I'm sure they do quite well. Uh, and if you're yeah, by the way, yep. An- another example of this is like, what does really good emails look like for written content? Like what does it actually look like to create an inspiration board of the best Twitter, LinkedIn, like written text content yeah. for people who are copywriters or uh, text, like just writers on the internet? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, with your taste, right? With some context. Um, exactly. Marketing examples. You know that one? Yep. Similar idea where they have a bunch of different categories, acquisition, conversion, retention, brand. And so I'm looking at right now, like, but, go ahead. By the way, the other way to do it is through content. Like if you want to do this as a creator, do what, if you're willing to dedicate your entire life to it, do what David Senra did with founders, right? This guy has picked a vertical and he's curating the best biographies and audio autobiographies in the world about the greatest founders. Yeah. And he has the taste to pick the best books. And then it's this combination of curation and then remixing. He's remixing it by basically re-delivering you what's most important and why you should care. So think about like what's a vertical where it takes a lot of work to do the curation, but that curation and that analysis is really important to the people that this is for. I like that. Founders for X is is a big idea. Yeah. Um, amazing, dude. This, is, this has been awesome. I actually have to run to... I. A haircut. I actually just got a haircut before I joined here, but I walked into my apartment and my wife was like, what happened to your hair? And I was like, what do you mean? It looks great. I looked at, I looked in the mirror. She's like, that's no, so mean. She's like the back, the back is oh, like, they, the, they, they fucked up the back. I mean, I'll show it for, for the people. I, I mean, I can't believe I'm doing this, but hold on. Let me see. Uh, can you see that? It's oh like curvy yeah. It's, it's not a straight, it's not a straight line. No. no. So yeah, your wife did you. Your wife did you a solid. It, it's it's like calling someone out when they have something stuck in their tooth. It's the equivalent of that. So I'm gonna go for a, a little even out. Cool. Yeah, and um, where could uh, where could folks find you and the projects you're working on? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Business Barista. My podcast is Founders Journal, where I'm curating the best uh, startup content on the internet and then synthesizing it. So you don't have to do the searching or the reading. Um, and then my new business story arb, which helps, uh, executives build their brands on social. I love it. Check them out. Come back anytime, Thanks, Alex. This is, this is obviously Appreciate it. so fun later. This was fun.